well, what word is that for us? And, and he said, you know, that word you always say. And long, long, long story short, he wanted me to teach him how to say y'all. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, y'all? And he's like, y'all? No, you don't go y'all. And so he came down and he spoke in some churches here in Texas. And he came back and he said, they loved me, Amy. I got up there and I went, shalom, y'all. So, uh, <laughs> shalom, y'all. Uh, I did just get back from Israel. In fact, I got back from Israel on Wednesday. And it was a, it was a joyous experience. It was also a heartbreaking experience. And, and uh, at the end of, of my testimony, I'll share with you more about what's going on in Israel. I'll share with you also during my testimony about what's going on with uh, the ministry that God has given me, which is Zadaka Ministries. And by the way, if you want to learn a little Hebrew, Zadaka Ministries is the Hebrew word for righteous. It's based out of Isaiah 64, 6, mm. which is our righteousness is as filthy rags before God uh, because our righteousness can only get us so far can't get us all the way to God. But just so in case any of you guys are worried, I do know that up at the Boss Hog Bowl, a certain football team is allegedly playing at 730 tonight. We will find out about 10 if they actually played or not. In fact, while I was in Jerusalem on, uh, I think it was on month, Saturday, Sunday night, last Sunday night, I was in the Arab Quarter in Jerusalem and I got myself a Dallas Cowboy t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And I don't know if you can tell, but it says Dallas in Hebrew. <laughs> and if you can tell, it also says Cowboys in Hebrew in the helmet part. So I do know the Dallas Cowboys play tonight, so don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, something else happened while I was in Israel. My computer just died, so unfortunately, or fortunately for you, my video also died. So I'm just going to have to share with you my testimony, and I hope that is acceptable. And I also forgot my clicker. This has been, I'm still on jet lag, and that's my excuse. And uh, some of the grounds know what trying to fly 12 and a half hours is like. It takes you a while to recover. So I'm going to share with you my testimony, and I first have to start, Miss Emily, with at the very, very beginning with my baby picture. Whenever it will come up. Whenever I believe it. There you go. That is, by the way, I'm the cute one with the mohawk. With the, the mohawk. Because mom said I had no hair, so she had to push all my hair up to the top and to, to make me look like I had any hair at all. And for those of you who are my former students, which is Emily and Sarah and Kurt, yes, that was the 1960s. You can make fun of it if you would like. I just turned 44 last week, so do the math. But I was born, I was born in 1969 to Jack and Barbara Downey. I was born on a Wednesday night, and back then they had revivals, and some of you are old enough to remember this. When they had a, a church revival, it started on a Sunday, it went to the next Sunday, and that included sun Saturday night. And so the first time I was in church was on Saturday night, uh, because I was always in church. In fact, I was in church 10 months before I got here, because I was a month late. So I was in church 10 months before I got here. I never knew anything but to be in church. And in fact, some of you a few months ago met my sister, the older one, in the plaid dress. My sister's going to Ecuador in, in November. My sister is Janice Hickey. And so Jack and Barbara Downey have two missionary daughters. Little did they know when that picture was taken what would happen to their children. But I was always in church. I grew up in church. I loved Jesus. I loved God. I loved being a, a, a wonder, having a wonderful Christian family growing up in. And, and, and everything was wonderful in my life. Until a month shy of my fourth birthday when my dad did the unthinkable. 
He left a perfectly comfortable, middle class, comfortable lifestyle, and we got into a U-Haul and left New Farmington, New Mexico, and moved to Louisville, Kentucky, for my dad to go to Bible college, because my dad decided that God had called him into the ministry. And some of you are too young to, to remember this. I'm a history teacher. Don't worry, Sarah and Kirk and Emily, you will not have a test over this. But if, and I will not tell the hippie story, Kirk and Emily and Sarah, so don't worry about that. But this was, but this was also during the time of the OPEC oil embargo, and I remember my mom sitting there, because gas was a quarter when we left farming to New Mexico. By the time we got to Dallas, gas was 75 cents. And I remember my mom going, who would pay 75 cents for a gallon of gas? <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, we're all like, what? Uh, but I just grew up in church. And when I was eight years old in a small Baptist church in, that, in Lubbock, Texas, um, where Brother Osborne is sitting, because we always sit on the piano side, you know, the pastor's family always has to sit on the piano side. My dad was preaching a sermon from Matthew chapter 7 about the wise man and the foolish man, and I realized that I was a foolish man. And after church that day, I, I became a believer in Jesus. Man. And, uh, and I realized that I, was, I couldn't depend on my salvation because daddy was a preacher and mom was a Sunday school teacher and, and, and all my family was believers. My salvation depended upon my own relationship with Jesus. And so when I was eight years old, I became a believer in Jesus. And you know, there are two kinds of pastor's kids. There's the good kind, and then there's the kind that make the pastors move a lot. I was the good kind. So was Janice, by the way. We were both, they got lucky. They had two good kinds. And uh, we were the good kind of pastor's kids. But And I remember when I was 16 years old. God said, Amy, I want you to surrender your life to full-time Christian service. And if you could go to the next slide, Emily. Uh, and I'll explain that picture in just a moment. But when I was 16 years old, God called me into full-time Christian service. And I said, God, I will do anything you want with my, with my life except. By the way, never tell God any words that start with except or but or anything like that. And I said, God, I'll do anything you want, but be a farmer's wife. We were living in Oklahoma. I didn't want to be a farmer's wife. But be a farmer's wife, a preacher's wife, or a missionary. Because I don't know if you've ever thought about what it means to be a missionary. Most female missionaries think about it. Single, they go off to some foreign country. They die of some bad disease. And then people name some offering after them. You know, it's not a pleasant life. And so I just didn't want to be a missionary. And I sure didn't want to be a pastor's wife. I had done my time. And so, by the way, I had grown up in church. That's the 70s for those of you who want to giggle. I'm the one wearing the white socks, just so you'll know. And I, I had grown up in church. I had grown up learning about missionaries. I had grown, and my parents had exposed me to missionaries. I had done, I my, grew up in part of my junior high years at uh, Pleasant Grove Baptist Temple, where Brother R.D. Wade is the pastor. I knew all about missionary work. And I didn't want to do it, because I knew it cost too much. Because Luke 9.62 says that he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom of God. And I didn't want to be guilty of putting my hand to the plow and then taking my hand off the plow. Because I knew what that would mean. And I was scared and I didn't want to do it. So I went off to college. And I got a teaching degree. And by the way, teachers are missionaries too. Never doubt that. Especially those who teach in the public school system. But that's not what God called me to do. But I was going to try to serve God my way. So I taught at Conroe High School in Conroe, Texas. And that wasn't what God wanted me to do. So I said, well, God, I'll go to seminary. So I went to seminary west of here in Fort Worth. And I went to chapel, except unless a missionary was in chapel. And I confess, I skipped chapel whenever a missionary came. Because I wasn't putting myself through that guilt. Except 
I did say, well, God, if you give me a husband, I'll think about it. And, uh, by the way, I'm still single. And, uh, but, you know, and I said, God, if you give me a husband, I'll think about it, but I'm not going to chapel because I'm not going to feel guilty. Graduated from Southwestern with my seminary degree. Was working at a college in East Texas as kind of their spiritual life director. And kids were getting saved. And, and there was a revival on the campus. And the kids were surrendering to the mission field. And, 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 there was a, and everything was going great on campus. But the spiritual life director was spiritually miserable. Mm. Because I was out of the will of God. Mm. Because I was still running from God. And by this time I'm 28 years old. But, and I have to backtrack for just a second because when I was in the sixth grade, Mrs. Casey, my sixth grade reading teacher, who, by the way, is not a Christian, had us to read the diary of Anne Frank. And from that moment on, everything I could read, everything that I could write about, everything that I could learn about was about the history, the Holocaust, or the Jewish people, or about Israel, or anything I could learn about was about the, the Jewish people. And my dad in his sermons preached the whole counsel of the Word of God, including the entirety of Romans 1.16, in which he says, I am not, which Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And a lot of people stop right there. There's four words that follow that phrase. To the Jew first. And Daddy preached those four words too. And he also preached Romans 9.3 where Paul says, I would wish myself accursed. He also preached Romans 11.11 11, where Paul writes that it's our job as Gentiles to make the Jewish people jealous for the gospel. And so everything in my life was leading up to that moment in East Texas, in Jacksonville, Texas, when I was running from God and I was having my quiet time that morning and I was reading out of Esther chapter 4 and I was getting ready to go to the college where the college was having the revival but the spiritual life director was miserable. In Esther chapter 4 where Esther and Mordecai are having the discussion and, and Mordecai is asking Esther to go before the king and, and Esther's afraid because of what it might cost her. And, and Mordecai is telling her through the liaison that, you know, God will save the Jewish people somehow. But who knows if you have not been called for such a time as this. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. So I close my Bible, have my prayer time, go off to work, come home from work. Going through my mail, oh, I qualify for another credit card. Ed McMahon's still alive, so I might have won $10 million. You know, all of those sort of bills. And then there's a letter <coughs> from Jews for Jesus. And I have friends who work for Jews for Jesus to this day. But I open up this letter, and across the top of the letterhead, sometimes God has to, like, smack me in the head, literally. And uh, it says, have you ever felt like God was calling you to missions? <laughs> <laughs> Not funny. <laughs> and a year and a half, well, six months, well, excuse me, a year and a half later, I find myself on a plane. And that's the reason for this bottom picture. That's the last picture I have with my dad. Because the very next day, I get on a plane to go to New York City. So if you go to the next slide, okay, eventually. Isn't technology wonderful? Uh, we'll get there. But that is the very, that's the very last picture I have with my dad before I get on a plane to go to New York City, where I live and I work for three years in New York City, working with Chosen People Ministries, working with, the Cho with, with Chosen People Ministries to try to reach the six million Jewish people who live in New York, who live in the U.S., including one out of every four New Yorkers who's Jewish. Are you having issues, Miss Emily, or is it just slow? Okay. Oh, it's okay. Hey, it's okay. Because because it's going to be her fault if y'all miss the cap. 
boys. I just want y'all to know that. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, because I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but there are 15 million Jewish people in the world today. Six million who live in the United States. About six million who live in Israel. About 250,000 who live in Australia. About 250,000 who live in New Zealand. Not, it's not quite that many in New Zealand. About 250,000 who live in South Africa. About, about a million who live in South America. It's scattered all around the world. And at this moment, 99% are living and dying and going to hell. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Because we talk about unreached people groups. And people will talk about, we need to go to the unreached people groups with the gospel. And the people who gave us the gospel, the people who gave us Abraham, Moses, David, Peter, Paul, Jesus, are one of the most unreached people groups living in the world today. At this moment, in Dallas-Fort Worth, in which Dallas-Fort Worth has around 55,000 50 to 55,000 Jewish people living in Dallas-Fort Worth today, 99% of the Dallas-Fort Worth Jewish population are at this moment living, dying, and going to hell. That means that you don't have to go to Israel to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. That means that you can go outside these doors and you can go to Walmart. That means you can go to Target. That means you can go next door. Do you realize that here in Arlington, there are, there are Jewish synagogues here in Arlington? That means that there are Jewish people here in Arlington who need the gospel. And that is one of the ministries, that, that's the whole purpose and point of why Sadaka Ministries, the ministry that God has given me, exist. Because I cannot reach all 15 million Jewish people with the gospel. They live too many different places. They live in Australia. That means you have a job, J.B., when you get there. That means they live in Israel. That means they live in Arlington. By the way, that means they live, they live in Hobart, Oklahoma. I have a Jewish friend who lives in Livingston, Texas. And if any of you have ever been in, in Livingston, Texas, that means you went there by accident. <laughs> and so, but who's going to reach my friend who lives in Livingston, Texas, unless it's the Christians in Livingston, Texas? That means we all have a job. A lot of times we think that it's our job to send missionaries. The moment we become believers in Jesus, we are missionaries. And that means we all have the job of missions. And we all have the job of Romans 11.11, 11, of making the Jewish people jealous for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Could you go to the next slide, Ms. Emily? Because I did live in New York. I was in New York on 9-11, and if you want, at the end, I'll tell you my 9-11 experience, how I got to witness to my Jewish next-door neighbor on 9-11. By the way, she never let me witness to her until 9-11. 9-11 happened. She wanted to hear about Jesus. Uh, but go to the next slide, Ms. Emily. Because we have to take advantages, and we need to take our chances that God gives us to share the gospel with the Jewish people. And, and I don't do a lot of infomercials. I'm horrible at infomercials. But on the table, in the foyer, I want you to know that Sadaka Ministries is not just about you, about me asking you for help. I want to help you. Because Sadaka Ministries, I want to give you the tools to reach the Jewish people that God places in your life and in your path gospel. There are videos out there. These videos are five and a half minutes long. What they do, and everybody in this video except for myself is a, is a Jewish believer in Jesus. This video shows through the Old Testament who Jesus was, is, and will be. And you can get, if you can't share Jesus with a Jewish person, you can do this. You can give this to them. 
And there's also ev typical evangelistic tracks out there. You could walk a Jewish person through a gospel presentation. And all of the materials, there's a book out there that's the only thing, but everything out there is for free for you to take. And I want you to take the materials. There's my prayer card is out there as well. But take the materials and take what you need to share the gospel with the Jewish people that God places in your life. Because I've never walked away from a church where I've shared at without one person going, I have a Jewish friend, or my boss is Jewish, or my son married a Jewish girl. There's somebody in this church that knows a Jewish person that needs Jesus. Take advantage of the materials that God has allowed me to create so that you can share with them about Jesus. Because you've got to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives you. And I just have a few, Miss Emily, if you can go to the next slide. To take advantage of some of those opportunities. I'll just tell you some of them while we're waiting. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was flying to London. And I'm going to share this story because there's a point to this story. I was flying to London. It was my first overseas flight. It was the first time I was going to get a stamp in my passport. I was so excited. And uh, I was ready. I had read up all on how to fly, how to avoid jet lag. By the way, if you've ever, had, if you've ever flown overseas, there's no way to avoid it, so just deal with it. Um, but I had read up on how to avoid jet lag. I had even bought those socks to help you so your feet don't swell. Doesn't work. Um, I had done everything, and I was ready. But every time I fly, I always say, God, you know who needs to sit by me? So if there's somebody that needs to sit by me that needs to hear about Jesus, let me do that. So I was ready. I was sitting on the plane. I was ready. And here comes Jonathan. And Jonathan sat by me on the plane, and we were talking, and uh, we were talking, and, and Jonathan noticed my, I have a, a necklace that has the Jesus fish attached to a Star of David attached to a menorah. It's a messianic seal. And he, he said, oh, are you Jewish? And I said, well, no, but my Jesus is. And so we started talking about the Jewishness of Jesus and et cetera, et cetera. And in the middle of the conversation, he goes, did I tell you I was Jewish? I said, well, that's okay. So is my Jesus. And we kept talking and we kept talking. And we're halfway over the Atlantic by now. And we're talking and we're talking. And he said, did I tell you that my mother is the only female rabbi in the entire country of Norway? And I said, well, that's okay. Jesus was a rabbi too. And we kept talking and we kept talking and we kept talking. And he, tell, he said, did I tell you that my grandfather is one of the few Norwegian Jewish people to go to a concentration camp during the Holocaust? And we talked about that. And I talked about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and we kept talking. And as we landed in London, I said, I said, Jonathan, I'm probably like no Christian you ever met in Norway. And Jonathan said, Amy, you're like no Christian I've ever met anywhere in my life. <laughs> I think I'm telling you that whole story because I want to make a point. Because you know where Jonathan was flying from? Jonathan had been a PhD student at Texas A&M. He had been a PhD student at Texas A&M. He's getting his PhD in electrical engineering. He had been at A&M, and if any of you are A&M fans, I'm not going to go there because Texas lost to the Mormons last night. But, um, <laughs> but uh, some of y'all are enjoying that too much. Um, but you know, he had been at you know A&M is supposed to be the Christian school, right? Where all the Christians go, and, I, and Texas is where the weirdos go. We all know that. Jonathan had been at A&M for two years. Never once had anyone shared Jesus with him. Never once. He had to sit by me for eight hours to hear the gospel from an American Christian for the first time. Now, this, the story gets even better because he had been in Denver the day before. 
and he had lost his passport, and his father, his mother's Norwegian, his father's Danish, and there happened, happened, you know, there is no happened with God. Amen. But there, he, there happened to be a Danish consulate in Denver so he could get a temporary passport based on his father's uh, birthplace. So he got a temporary passport to fly from Denver to Dallas, Dallas to London, to sit by me to hear about Jesus for the first time. <clears throat> As we were landing in London, he said, I hope they let me off the plane. And I'm like, have I been sitting by a terrorist for eight hours? <laughs> and uh, Because at Denver, they had put the wrong birth date on his passport. So he actually had an invalid passport. So he had an invalid passport from, a, from his father's nation, nation status to sit by me for eight hours to hear about the gospel for the first time in his entire life, even though he had been at A&M, the Christian school, for eight or two years. That shouldn't happen. And I should have had to be in Oklahoma City Airport to, to witness to a man flying to Chicago who's never heard the gospel before. I shouldn't have to be in the Israeli airport Wednesday night talking to the security guard who's going through my suitcase and have to explain to her that, you know, Jesus is Jewish too. And by the way, this, this girl had never heard that Jesus was Jewish and that Jesus could be her Messiah too. Think about that. And you have to take advantages of the opportunities that God puts in front of you to share the gospel. You don't have to be an official missionary to be a missionary. You just have to be willing and available and open to share and to take advantages of the, God, of the coincidences that God puts in front of your life. And that's all we have to do. And if, God, if we are willing and able, God will gain the increase. Some of us are afraid to should go out and share the gospel. Who said it was our job to save anybody? Amen. Thank you. Whoever did that, thank you. Uh, <laughs> our job is just to be seed planters. Amen. It's God Amen. Who needs the increase. And uh, I, you know, I, I have I have on there the Jewish Learning Fest, and I just want to share that story real quick because every year I go to the Dallas Jewish Learning Fest. This year I almost got kicked out. Because they said, she's one of those Christians. If I got kicked out, I wanted my $18 back. But anyway. <laughs> but, you know, every time I go, they're like, well, you're not that bad. You're kind of nice for one of those Christians. Because you know why? Because they need to see that we love them. Amen. They need to see that we have the opportunity to share. Because, you know, and I'm sharing all of these stories with you because I want you to understand I cannot reach all 15 million Jewish people with the gospel. I would love to, and I try. You can ask my mom. It keeps me up at night. But I need your help to do it. Zadaka Ministries needs your help. Because if you don't, nobody else will. Because I can promise you, my mom calls for me. And she has had a lot of churches who will say, well, they've done had their chance. Mm. Yeah. Or, you know, well, they killed Jesus. She's had people tell her that. And if you want to hear some, if you want to see somebody who's responsible for the death of Jesus, go home and look in the mirror. Amen. Um, That's right. But ultimately, what did Jesus say? No one takes my life from me. I lay it down. I pick it up. Amen. Amen. But if you don't, nobody else will. And I'll share with you more stories in just a moment. Go to the next slide for me, Miss Emily. And actually, you can go, go on to the next slide. Because Zadaka Ministries is about equipping you. Zadaka Ministries is equipping you, giving you the tools to witness to the Jewish people, giving you the opportunities to the witness to the Jewish people. And if you don't know any Jewish people, and if you can't find any Jewish people, <coughs> number one, you're not looking. But number two, if you can't, you can still pray for the Jewish people. When I was in Jerusalem last week, I stayed at the, the Christ Church uh, guest house, which is just inside. Have you been to Israel? 
Uh, Y'all need to send him to Israel, by the way. Uh, I'm just trying to help you out, okay? Uh, I stayed at the Christchurch Guest House, which is just inside the Jaffa Gate. And they have on their church sign, it's like a hostel. It says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But you know, you can't pray for, a lot of people just think that means to pray for peace in the Middle East. That's not what that verse means. That means that you cannot have peace if you do not have Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because peace is impossible. Because the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. We all know that. But that doesn't just mean the absence of war. The Hebrew word for peace doesn't just mean the absence of war. It means wholeness and completeness. And you cannot have that without a relationship with the, without the Messiah. Amen. Amen. You have to have a relationship with the Messiah, who is Jesus, to have wholeness and completeness. Amen. And so if we're, you can pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You can pray for the peace of the Jewish people by joining with Sadaka Ministries to pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. And if you don't know any Jewish people, you can still pray for the Jewish people. And if you're interested in that, after the service is over, my mom will talk to you about how you can sign up to be a part of the day of prayer for the, for the salvation of the Jewish people that we have every year. And you can be a part of that as well. Because I want to finish up before I take some of your questions with two quick stories. And similarly, you can do that for me. Yeah. I want to tell you about two of my friends, and then I'll finish up very quickly. With, and I'll take some questions. Because, see, I'm, I'm watching the clock because the cowboy started at 7 <laughs> I want to tell you about my friend named Jack. Jack was born, my dad was born in 1934. My dad died in July of 2000. But Jack was born in 1934. My dad's name was Jack, and he was born in 1934. My dad was born in Honey Grove, Texas. Jack was born in Italy. Uh, my dad's. Uh, was born to a tenant farmer and to a farmer's wife, Jack. This Jack was born to a watchmaker and a nightclub singer. So that's where the differences change. Uh, Jack's father, and everything was fine in Italy until 1944, 1943, until after Mussolini fled, after the invasion of Italy by the Allies. Hitler invaded. I don't think we have too many small children. I'll be careful, Mom, back there. Uh, we had, and everything was fine until, you know, Mussolini fled, the invasion of Italy. Hitler invaded Italy primarily because Mussolini would not turn over the Italian Jewish population. They rounded up all of the men, including Jack's father. They sent the Italian men. Poland, Jack never saw his father again. Jack's mother knew that they would be next. So Jack's mother took Jack, his younger sister, and his grandmother, and at night climbed the Italian Alps by night, slept 